welcome to your TV classroom. Today is Thursday, January 14th. How are you today? How was your evening last night? I had a great evening when I was at work yesterday. Oliver's nanny and him made oatmeal chocolate chip cookies. And so when I got home, Oliver wanted to share his cookies with me and they were delicious. Do you like cookies? My favorite are homemade cookies. They're the best. So before we get started today, Let's check in with our zones. It's really important right now as this pandemic's been going on for a long time. And we've been out of school for a long time and there's talks of maybe some kids coming back to school and things are kind of starting to change that we really make sure we pay attention to our emotions. And when we're not feeling in the green zone, that we do those calm down strategies to get ourselves there. You might need to talk to a trusted person. You might need to just take some time in your room, quiet, read a book. You might need to do some deep breathing or go for a walk. All of those things are healthy. It's also healthy to say, I've had too much, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, friend, I need a break. You need to let people know that if that's what you're needing, okay? That's a healthy thing to do. Now. It's not okay to just always need a break and not do what you're supposed to do. But if you really do need a break and you're feeling overwhelmed, it's healthy to identify that and let the trusted people around you know, okay? So check in with your zone today. How are you feeling? I'm in the green zone, I'm ready to go. I hope you are too. If you're not in the green zone, that is okay. Own those feelings, feel them. And as we're doing What's Missing Thursday, use some of our strategies that we've learned from Chile to get to as close to the green zone as you can for our main lesson. But we would love you to participate with us as you're doing that. All right, it's What's Missing Thursday. So we're gonna take a look at our first problem. Let's see. Before we can figure out what's missing, we need to figure out what we know. Now, last week we talked about how multiplication and division are related. Right? We have a total amount, and then we have the groups and the number in, in, in each group. So what do we know here? Do we know how many groups? Nope. Do we know how many in each group? Yes. And do we know how many total we have? Yes, we know the total amount. So how are we gonna figure this out? Can you think of a fact that has nine and 27 as the product. Yes, three times nine is 27. See how when you think about the facts you know, it can help you solve the part you don't know? And it's so important to start with what we know. If all we focus on is what we don't know, sometimes our brains can get into this cycle. I don't know, I don't know, I don't understand it, I don't remember, I can't remember, I don't know, I don't. And then you get really frustrated and overwhelmed. But if you say, there's a part I don't know, but there are things I do know, that can help you get to solving the problem. Let's look at the next one. What do we know? We know there are five in each group, yes. What else do we know? There's 40 total. Okay, how are we gonna figure this out? You might know the fact. What's a nut, what if you didn't know the fact? What would we do? Yeah, we count by fives and figure out how many groups it is. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. How many groups? Eight. Eight times five is 40. We use what we know to figure out what we don't know. Okay, what do we know? Yep, two in each and 50 total. What was that, Rafa? Oh, Rafa said, well, Mrs. Wally, if there's only two groups and 50 is the total, I'm kind of thinking like quarters. Two quarters is two groups that makes 50. How much is a quarter worth? 25, right? 25 cents and 25 cents is 50 cents. So if I have 25 groups of two, or let's do the inverse, two groups of 25, does that make 50? Which is the more efficient way to solve this? Count by twos till you get to 50 or Take 50 and split it into two groups. Yeah, take 50 and split it into two groups. So we think it's 25. Now let's read this problem. 
25 groups of two equals 50. I don't want to count that out. I know multiplication. I can reverse it. And I can say two groups of 25 equals 50. If that's true, then 25 groups of two is also going to equal 50. Is two groups of 25 50? Yes, we know because two quarters makes 50 cents. We've got it. OK. What times 7 is 49? Hmm. We know there's 7 in each group. We know there's 49. Do any of you know the fact? Yep, this is one I have memorized. It is 7. 7 times 7 is 49. It's one of those ones that are hard to figure out. It's hard to use distributive property. There aren't a lot of efficient strategies for it. So it's one of the facts you truly, really should memorize. There's only a few that you really have to memorize. Ah, what times 6 is 36? 6 times 6 is 36. That's another one that you can memorize. Awesome. Today, we are learning to identify patterns within addition and multiplication, OK? So we're going to be looking at patterns today just like yesterday. Like I said yesterday, we're going to continue on today. So we're going to review what we did yesterday, redo part of yesterday, and talk more about the patterns we're seeing. And I'm going to be doing some um, writing down and charting the things that we're talking about, OK? All right. I think. Miss Oslin is out in the hallway, but she'll come in when she's ready. So this said to shade all of the odd sums in the table. And so we did that, right? We went through and we colored in all of the odd sums. And then we talked about a pattern we were noticing. What are some of the patterns you noticed? Some of the patterns you noticed. We noticed that when we did odd plus odd, it was even, right? Like 1 plus 1 made 2. And then we noticed that when we did even plus odd, the answer was odd. And then we noticed that when we did even and even, the answer was even. I wonder why those things are true. Why is it that when we do an odd plus an odd, it makes an even number? Well, let's look. Let's say we do 3 plus 3. And I'm going to actually draw out the 3. What makes a number odd? A number's odd when you split it in half and there's one piece left over. It means you can't equally split it in half with whole numbers. You're going to have to break a whole number into pieces. So like the number 3, I can split it and have 1 and 1, but then I still have this left over, right? So, but if I have two of those, that means I have a group of two here and a group of two here, and look what happens. Because I had one left over in this odd number of three, and one left over in this odd number of three, now all of a sudden, I have two pieces left over, which means now we've created an even number, because six can be split in half. Let's try it with another two more odd numbers. I want you to try it with the same odd numbers or different odd numbers on your whiteboard. I'm going to do 7 plus 5. Now, I can go 1, 2, 3 for 7 and have a group of 3, and have a group of 3, and then I have one left over. And for 5, I can do 4, and I can do 4, but look. I have one left over. And now I can put all this together and split it in half. I can have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. My answer is 12. 
which can be split in half. Whoa, that's cool. Okay, so that's review from there, from yesterday. Let's move on to the multiplication. Okay. It says, shade all even products in the table. Describe a pattern you see. So I'm, Mr. Kevin, we can bring this one up really big. I'm gonna shade it in here on the PowerPoint. So let's look and see. I'm going to shade the even products. That means the numbers that can be split in half equally. Can one be split in half equally in, with just whole numbers? No, what about two? Yeah, two can. Well, I'm on pen. I want no. I'm on highlighter. Two can. What about three? No. Nope. What about four? Yep. What about five? What about six? Okay. Now, two. Yep. Four. Yep. Six. Wait a minute. Eight. This entire row can be shaded in. I wonder why. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's go on to three. Three, nah. Six, yep, that's even. Nine, nah. Twelve, yep, that's even. Eighteen, yep. Hmm. I'm starting to notice something. Is anyone else noticing it? Hmm. Let's go on to the next row. Four, mm-hmm. Eight, yep. Twelve, yep. Sixteen, you betcha. Twenty, twenty-four. Rafa, what are you noticing? I wonder if the kids at home are noticing. Yeah, I'm only shading in products that have a row with an even number. Or a column with an even number. Look, all of these. All of these, all of these. These are all even. And then I go to the columns. And I, I'm not going to shade in the one, the three, or the five. I've already shaded these ones in because they were in the even row. But then I get to two, and look, I have to do it all the way down. Then I get to three and only the ones that were in the rows that were even. Huh, I wonder why this is. Does anyone have any ideas? Anyone noticing a pattern that they see? Let's look at it the way we did with addition. I'm gonna do E for even, O for odd, okay? So I'm gonna put on my whiteboard, even times even. What does that make? Let's look. Two times two is four. It's even. Let's try another one and make sure. Six times six, 36. It's even. Okay, what if we do even times odd? What do we get? Two times three is six. It's even. Okay, what about Five times four, 20, it's even. So when we do even times odd, we also get even. What about if we do odd times odd? Five times three, 15, it's odd. Are there more even products or odd products? Yeah, there's more even products. Look at our addition table. It's about half and half, isn't it? So with addition, it's about half and half. But with multiplication, majority of our products are even. I wonder why. Why do you think that happens? Oh, because we're not just putting two add-ins together, we're having multiple groups of the same number, right? And if you have five groups of six, you're still having even groups, right? If I put all those even groups together, 
it's gonna be even. Right, but if I have an odd number of odd groups, it's gonna stay odd. And if I have an even number of even groups, it's gonna stay even. So if there's an even amount of groups or an even amount in each group, the product's going to be even. Here's a hint. Most of the um, facts you need to memorize are the ones that have two odd factors. They're the ones that are hard to double. They're the ones that are hard to figure out. Seven times seven, odd. Nine times nine, odd. The ones with odd, two odd factors and an odd product are the ones you have to memorize the most. All right. How are multiplication and addition patterns alike? Yeah. So it changes, right? They change whether you have even or odd numbers. And how are they different? We already talked about that, right? How it's like, kind of like 50-50 and then mostly even with multiplication. So it says, find the two sums of 11 in the addition table on the previous page. What pattern do you see in the add-ends? Does the same pattern happen with other sums that show up in the table? So let's go back to the table. The two with 11. Do you see 11 there? It's right here. We have six plus five and six plus five. Interesting. What about four? There's two plus two, there's three plus one, and then one plus three. Go back to kindergarten in first grade when you were talking about all the ways to make the number 10 or all the ways to make the number eight, and we would call them switch partners or switcheroos or reverse partners where you'd have one and eight makes nine and eight and one makes nine, and we'd switch the add ends and we would realize that it was the same thing. That's what's happening here in this addition table. So your homework for today is to do page 279 and 280 in your workbook, looking at these patterns, shading in what they ask you to shade and really see what are you noticing happening with these even and odd numbers in these addition and multiplication tables. Today we learned to identify patterns within addition and multiplication. We looked for patterns in the sums in the addition chart. We looked for patterns in the products and we talked about even and odd and how those, it makes a difference as to what our answer is going to be. And we explained our thinking. Now we could spend hours on patterns and we're gonna keep talking about patterns. This is just the beginning. All right, now before I let you go, um, oh, I don't have Miss Oslin's slide on here. You're going to need to get your learning buddy ready for Miss Oslin and I'll make sure she lets you know if there's anything else you need for her, for her today. Okay, have a great break and I will see you tomorrow. Let's do a little stretching with our breathing now. Inhale your arms over your head and bring your palms together. Now as you exhale, arch your back and make goal posts in, from your arms. Then inhale up again and relax. Let's repeat that. Inhale, exhale, inhale, stretch up and exhale Bach lived from 1685 to 1750 that means in 1700 he was 15 and guess what the world he lived in then was just as turbulent as ours is today some of the things that happened that year were a mega earthquake near Tacoma which caused a tsunami in Japan Europeans changed to a new calendar that began its numbers from the birth of Christ Huge fires destroyed the capital of Scotland and part of the capital of Ethiopia. Wars were fought by Sweden, Germany, Latvia, Denmark, Poland, Russia, Spain, and France. William Penn began holding meetings for the emancipation of enslaved people here in the United States. New York and Massachusetts passed laws forcing all Catholic priests to leave their territory under punishment of death. If Bach could turn to music to comfort him through all the ups and downs of that, you and I can find comfort in it now too. And you know what? Even with all that chaos happening, one special thing stands out about that year too. The piano was invented in 1700. We've all gotten to enjoy piano music ever since. 
Let's listen to one other dance Bach wrote for the violin. This one is called a Sarabande. It's slower, maybe a little sadder, but it also helps me relax and feel my feelings. If I were to think of words for how this music makes me feel, I would say gentle and touching. What words would you describe it with? Feel free to move to this dance music too and see if you let your body sway and your heart open while you breathe to the music how it feels. third graders, welcome back from your break. I see you have your ELA packets and pencil and your learning buddy. And I see that a lot of you grabbed a lot of your graphic organizers, your biographies that we've been working on and your writing notebook, even though I didn't remind you. So excellent job on that. If you didn't grab those, I didn't tell you to, so that's okay. I don't expect you to read Mrs. Oslin's brain, but if you could quickly and safely grab them, that would be really helpful when I send you off to do your independent work today. As some of our friends are finishing gathering their materials, let's remind ourselves of our three personal standards. When we come together, every day we all agree to show respect, make good decisions, and solve problems. And I just have the thought that I'm gonna encourage you not just to use these three personal standards when we come together, but just, you know, in your life in general. They're just some good standards to live by. Little, little tidbit for you from Mrs. Oslin. We have been working on biographies. We read about biographies. We read biographies, noticing the features that authors use. We have been writing our own biographies. We went through the process of brainstorming and thinking about who inspires us or who has created change in a world. Who can we find information about? We talked about um, learning about the other people in our subjects' lives, and we learned this week about using quotes from the people around us, or around our subject, or the subject themselves, to really make it clear why we chose our subject and how our subject came to be the person that they are. 
So today we're going to learn biographers create engaging leads that capture readers' attention and express their feelings or beliefs about their subjects. And this is where your graphic organizers that you've been working on are going to come in handy because you captured a lot of thinking about your beliefs and feelings about your subject based on what they have done and what they have accomplished. And you came up with a lot of words, characteristics to describe your subject. So you're going to use that to help you write the beginning of your biography. And the key word here is engaging. And that means when your reader picks up your biography to read it, we want them to have the sense of, I can't put this down. I need to know more. This is so engaging. It gets their attention. So keep that in mind as you create your opening or your lead to your biography today. We're going to get back into the book Mother to Tigers, which is written by George Ella Lyon and illustrated by Peter Catal Catalanato. And we're going to use this book and the lead or the opening of this book as an example for how our author wrote an engaging lead so that the reader, you and I, would want to keep reading. So this is what the opening looks like. And they have a picture and they have words. And just notice how they made it kind of look like the paper is torn around the words. I just thought that was really interesting. And at first when I saw this, I was like, I want to read this because I want to know more about how the author and illustrator designed this together. But we're going to zero in. That means look really closely at the words that are written and think about and notice how our author wrote this to capture our attention and make us want to keep reading. So we're going to read it all through, all the way through once. And then we'll go back and look at some of their word choice and some of the ideas that they did, some of the ideas and words that they used that talk about or maybe hint at what their, th their thinking or beliefs about their subject is. So let's get reading. I'm going to make sure I got my highlighter ready. Here we go. Suppose a woman bathed you. Suppose she warmed milk on the stove and poured it in a bottle and put you on a pillow in her lap to drink till you were full and sleepy. Then put you in a box that would be your bed in a kitchen that would be your home till you got big enough to roam the apartment, stalking the sofa, pouncing on the chairs, till you outgrew a human's house and went home to the Bronx Zoo. Your name would be MacArthur, and the woman who saved you, Helen Frances Teresa Delany Martini. Now, our author has really captured our attention by making us imagine that a woman bathed us. She gave us warm milk on the soap. How are you feeling right now? I was picturing this in my mind and I was like, ooh, I'm cozy. I'm all warmed up. My belly is full. I'm sleepy. And then I pictured myself uh, big enough to roam the apartment. That word roam. Not just big enough to walk around the apartment, but roam. That's a word that we use when we're talking about animals, right? We talk about how um, I've heard on shows that I've watched where they say like the lions roam their habitat. Hmm. They walk around it. Uh, and they go on to use words like stalking and pouncing. So you got big enough to roam the apartment, stalking the sofa, pouncing on the chairs, till you outgrew a human's house and went home to the Bronx Zoo. Now, it's not until, up until this point, I pictured me being a human, but now I'm going home to the Bronx Zoo. Now I'm picturing myself as an animal. Now I want to go back and reread, picturing myself as an animal. Let's do that. Suppose a woman bathed you. Suppose she warmed milk on the stove and poured it in a bottle and put you on a pillow in her lap to drink until you were full and sleepy. I'm going to highlight those words, full and sleepy. Then put you in a box 
that would be your bed in a kitchen that would be your home. Now that's where the feeling changes, right? So now I'm knowing that it's an animal. So I'm picturing an animal snuggly and warm till you got big enough to roam the apartment, stalking the sofa, pouncing on the chairs, till you outgrew a human's house and went home to the Bronx Zoo. Now the author has really not only used interesting and creative word choice, but they really made me feel two very different feelings. At first I'm calm and sleepy, then I'm active and alert, stalking and roaming and pouncing. Interesting. Your name would be MacArthur and here is where our subject is introduced. And the woman who saved you, Helen Francis Teresa Delany Martini. Now, there we go. Our author has chose, chosen the word saved. That gives me a hint, just a little hint, about what our author thinks about the characteristics of Helen Francis Teresa Delany Martini. That she saves animals. Very interesting. So take a moment and read through this one more time and think about what does George Ella Lyon do in the beginning of this book that is different from other biographies that we have read? Who is our author talking to? And what emotions do you feel when you hear our author's words? Take some think time. Now turn and tell your learning buddy if there's something that you notice that's different in this biography. Think about who is our author talking to and what emotions did you feel? Rafa, I'm noticing that our author, this is almost like a poem. It's almost like, I don't, I don't know, it's making me feel things as opposed to just giving me information. And that's different than the other biographies that we read. And I feel like the author is talking directly to me, really engaging me, really making me feel emotions. Like I'm at first, well, very different emotions because at first I'm feeling calm and happy and full, which really isn't an emotion, but I can picture it in like my body, like after I've eaten and I feel full and warm and sleepy. But then I want to, I want to actually get up and be active and alert, stalking and roaming like animals do. Now that we've read an example of an engaging lead or the opening to a biography, I want you in your ELA packet to find page 22. And this is gonna give us, it's called introducing my subjects, my subject. And this is gonna give us some tips for when you go off to do your independent writing today and you write the beginning or the lead of your biography, ways to make it really engaging and interesting for your reader. And also a way that you can give your reader a hint about how you feel your opinions and thoughts about your subject. So I'll give you a moment to find this document. All right, now we are gonna look at the first two bullets really closely. And the first bullet says, describe a scene from your subject's life using words that show your subject's historical importance, perseverance, and or bravery. That's an idea or one way that you could write your lead. You could also use powerful line, font, quote, et cetera, about your subject that shows the type of person he, she, or they was or is. So you could use one of the quotes that we talked about earlier this week. You could use a fact. You gathered a lot of facts or interesting things about your subject that you could use. 
You could also, let's look at the next two bullets. Use interesting font, which means make it bold, use capital letters. Our example that we just read used italics to bring emphasis to certain words that represent your subject. So our author, George Ella Lyon, used italics, and that kind of made me think that it was written more as poetry. But you could also use bold letters or capital letters if you really want all or part of your lead to stand out to your subject. You could use words and examples that evoke emotion, draw your readers in and help them understand the type of person your subject was or is. And our author in our uh, Mother to Tigers did an excellent job of using words that evoke emotion, draw your readers in and help us understand. You could also name and define three attribute, attributes that you think best describe your subject. You have already collected words that describe your subject and attributes. So go back and look at that list in the graphic organizer and see if you can use some of those. You could describe the beginning of your subject's journey, including time and place. So start at the beginning of their life and describe What's happening? When is it happening? Where is it happening? And finally, after you introduce your subject, you can state your opinion about your subject so it is clear to readers how you feel. Like our author did in Mother to Tigers, talked about how, and it made me feel like I was saved by the subject. So you could do that as well. Today we learned that biographers create engaging leads, that's the opening, that capture readers' attention and express their feelings or beliefs about their subject. And your independent work today is in your writing notebook. You're gonna to begin to draft, which means write your lead, knowing that we'll go back and, and revise, which means change it to make it better. Today is just the first day. Don't worry about spelling, just get your ideas down on paper. Remember, you're gonna use this chart to help you introducing your subject and pick a couple of these bullet points to help you, give you ideas. Do not feel like you have to use all of them. Pick a couple and remember, like I said, we can always go back in and add more. Revise when we want to later. Now, you're also gonna continue reading your biographies. If you have biographies at home that you've been reading for your independent reading every day, Pay close attention to how the authors and the biographies that you are reading wrote their leads to make it engaging and interesting for you as a reader. And pay te close attention to, are you really understanding what you're reading? And if you're not, use this chart to help you. You're also gonna pay close attention to, how focused are you? Are you finding that after you've been reading for a while, your brain starts to think about something else? That happens to all of us all the time. If it does, use this chart to help you refocus back on your reading. And as always, continue adding to your reading log. You're gonna wanna make sure that at the end of every week, you send this to your teachers so that they know what you are working on. Now, this is a time for our affirmation. This is the time where at the end of our lesson, we get to remind ourselves of how amazing we are. And so our affirmation today will be, I am amazing. Practice saying that with me. I am amazing. And it's especially important for you to repeat that to yourself throughout the day, especially when you're not feeling so amazing, even though you are. Third graders, thank you so much for reading and thinking and feeling with me today. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow in our TV classroom. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.